Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And what I'm going to give you here is a series of talks over the next year looking at a case-based approach to different challenges in CT. That is, instead of giving you lots and lots of facts, I'm going to focus more on showing you lots of images. So we're going to look at splenic masses. So when you think about uh, what we talk about with the spleen, many of the times we pick up incidental splenic lesions. Now the question always has been is how important are incidental splenic lesions? Well, the answer is in this article by Seward, in an incidental splenic mass, the likelihood of malignancy is low and they make the point that follow-up may not be indicated. They talk about incidental masses up to 14% of autopsies, but again, cysts, hemangiomas, hermartomas, and the like. Now, of course, one of the things we know is there are many things that involve the spleen, from lymphoma to metastatic disease like melanoma to abscesses, but I think the point is those typically aren't incidental findings. Patients with lymphoma have fever or weight loss or extra splenic findings as well. Patients with an abscess are febrile or have a history. So the incidental splenic mass is really a challenge. There have been in articles, the uh, ACR white paper initially looking at incidental findings, uh, recommended further evaluation of follow-up for all incidental splenic lesions over a sonometer that do not clearly have benign features at imaging. The majority of such solid splenic nodules and masses are benign with hemangio the most frequent diagnosis. However, CT imaging characteristics of benign and malignant masses often overlap. So that's one of the challenges that sometimes you see a low density lesion. And I'm gonna show you some examples where it could be a number of different things. So it's never always gonna be simple. You talk about the spleen and you think about different lesions, you say, well, we could talk about congenital, we could talk about trauma-related, inflammation like abscesses or infarcts, benign tumors, malignant tumors, and systemic processes, let's say Gaucher's disease might be a good example. Now, what can you do clinically? Well, you could simply follow the patient. You could look at old scans. If they're available, that's often the easiest thing. You could look at the clinical history for important findings. You could do a biopsy, or if necessary, you even could do a splenectomy. So what do we think about when I look at a splenic lesion? Well, I like to look at how the lesion looks in the spleen, and I'm going to show you a lot of cases how I do that. I look for extra splenic findings. Does the patient have liver mets, liver nodules? Does the patient have adenopathy? Is there something in the kidney? What about the clinical history? Is the patient febrile? Did the patient have endocarditis? Did the patient have diverticulitis? And look at past medical history. Patient with sickle cell disease, what you may be looking at is an autoinfarcted spleen or infarction and thalassemia or extramedullary hematopoiesis. So again, history also becomes incredibly uh, critical. Now in the challenge, let's work through a series of cases Let's define the best diagnosis or the most likely diagnosis. Let's have a pattern approach to specific cases, and let's get started. Okay, left upper quadrant pain. There's a mass that's immediately adjacent to and superior to the spleen. The patient had symptoms, that was the issue. If you look at the mass, it kind of looks a little bit like the spleen. It's enhancing, sort of has a moray pattern on the arterial phase imaging. Remember, we're always going to say accessory spleens are common, but they kind of enhance just like the spleen. This is kind of so-so. And if you go to venous phase, you can see it's still brighter than the spleen and looks different. Typically on venous, it also would be identical to the spleen. And so it kind of bothered you. It looks like a spleen, but it's a funny location. Accessory spleens are near the splenic hilum, but could be almost anywhere. But this is above the spleen. It was kind of weird and the patient was symptomatic. Here it is on uh, the cinematic rendering. You can see a small feeding vessel to this from the splenic artery. Again, its texture is a bit different than the regular spleen, and here's just an example. But when you look closely, it also has some similarity in the moray pattern. And I did believe, although it wasn't perfect, I thought that perhaps the best diagnosis was indeed an accessory spleen. And that's what we said, but because the patient was symptomatic, they removed this and it was an accessory spleen. Another example, this was initially read as a neuroendocrine tumor, an uh, enhancing lesion, tail of pancreas. 
And that's a good thought. But if you look carefully, it looks identical to the spleen. And if you look at it through the various phases, it has that moray pattern, just like the spleen. And then you think about it, could this simply be splenic tissue sitting on the tail of the pancreas? Again, it's a tough call because you don't want to miss a three centimeter neuroendocrine tumor. Well, that ended up being resected. Nuke studies were done. We just weren't positive. This was a five centimeter uh, spleen splenosis involving the tail of the pancreas. Now we talk about accessory spleens being common. Up to 16% of patients undergoing CT will have accessory spleens, but they're usually less than two centimeters in size. They enhance equal to the normal spleen, although smaller lesions may not. And as I mentioned, they can simulate pathology. I just showed you a case of pancreas. Sometimes renal or adrenal are other possibilities. Now, when you see a case like this, it's separate from the tail of the pancreas. It looks identical to the spleen. I don't think this is going to be a case where, oh my goodness, what am I going to do about this patient? That's not the issue. So things that are important to remember, that splenic tissue can simulate a neuroendocrine tumor of the tail of the pancreas. Splenic tissue in the pancreas simulates a tumor, but still has the enhancement looking like the spleen and not the vascularity typically of a neuroendocrine tumor. And occasionally I've seen post-left nephrectomy splenic rotations or accessory spleens simulating tumor recurrence. So at least I'll mention that as something else to think about. So let me go a little bit more into this uh, dilemma with this ectopic splenic tissue. It's the result of splenic tissue buds failing to fuse during embryologic development and are common as we mentioned before, accessory splenic tissue is usually asymptomatic and found incidentally, the most common location being the hilum of the spleen. However, up to 15% are seen in the pancreatic tail, and this is when they're diagnostically difficult. CT can be used to differentiate between these intrapancreatic accessory spleens and neuroendocrine tumors with high sensitivity and specificity, by looking at appearance, location. Stephanie Colquia wrote this article a number of years ago. And again, the point being that all intrapancreatic accessory spleens in the study were located at the tip or within 3CM of the tip of the tail of the pancreas. Therefore, if an enhancing mass is seen more than several centimeters from the tip of the tail of the pancreas, is unlikely to be anything but a neuroendocrine tumor. Now, we've also written an article about post-splenectomy or post-splenic trauma about isolated splenules developing. And in that situation, we know it could be in the lung, it could be in the pelvis, it could be next to the aorta. It can simulate many different pathologies. But when we talk about an accessory spleen, typically by the tail of the pancreas, it's where the patient has not had trauma, but it's this accessory spleen there. So again, something indeed to think about. Now, going back to Stephanie's comment, and with any accessory spleen, if you're not certain if it's a tumor or a spleen, one of the things that works well is 99M technetium label heat damage red blood cells, and MRI also can be helpful. So that may be the easiest thing to do. Now, they're not perfect either, but often you can make the diagnosis and there's no need for biopsy and there's no need for an invasive procedure. An article by Ba made the point, 10 of 303 patients who underwent a distal pancreatectomy had a final diagnosis of intrapancreatic accessory spleens. So it's a small percent, but not that small. It's still 3%. So you really would hate to make that diagnosis. Again, the common lesions were described as round, well-marginated, and enhancing masses within the pancreatic tail. Average age of patients was 54, so it's the same age typically of neuroendocrine tumors, and you could see where the problem comes in. Ba goes on to say, workup of an incidental pancreatic solid lesion remains a challenge, especially by the tail of the pancreas, where you could be fooled by the splenic lesions. Again, you need to think about it to be able to reach the right diagnosis. And here's just a good example. This is by the splenic hilum. 
and you want to say accessory spleen. But the point is, it's much brighter than the spleen. This is arterial phase, and it's much brighter than the moray pattern. And that's a very good way of thinking about things. There's no chance this is an accessory spleen. This is a neuroendocrine tumor off the tail of the pancreas. Remember, sometimes people mistake what's a neuroendocrine tumor and call it accessory spleen. So you can make this mistake in either direction, but this lesion is just way too bright. And even though, yes, it's a great location near the hilum of the spleen, this is a neuroendocrine tumor off the pancreas. So again, think about this and recognize that you can make the errors in many different ways. And you can see I'm showing you lots of images to really get a good feel of this lesion. Here it is with cinematic rendering. And you could see the texture with the cinematic rendering is different of the spleen and of the neuroendocrine tumor, which again can be very helpful in that regard. This image, it looks a little bit more similar, but again, it's a neuroendocrine tumor, nothing else. Now, in terms of incidental findings, it's not uncommon to see splenic lesions that are cystic, which could be simple cysts, particularly epithelial cysts, but also epidermoid, old hematomas, sometimes with calcification, abscesses, but they're usually not cystic as much as they are low density, prior infarction, which prior bleeds, cystic, and cystic neoplasm. So there's a lot of things to think about. Often you'll see large lesions. The patient has some vague pain or even sometimes incidental, but you see a cystic lesion. This was a unilocular simple splenic cyst. Water density well-defined, sharply marginated. Now you can see it's having mass effect on the stomach and mass effect on the spleen and on the diaphragm superiorly, and so this was resected. So it's not the case that if you have a benign lesion, you're not going to resect it. If lesions get large enough, they're resected because the patients become symptomatic. Theoretically, also, there's an increased risk of rupture and bleed, but that's exceedingly rare. And here, just to show you, sometimes these splenic lesions look like they may be pushing on the spleen, like maybe it's a pseudocyst from the tail of the pancreas. You could think about that. But when you look at all of the, le the, the images, you can see right here at the very edge how the lesion really is pushed and it's really the spleen. It really is the spleen. There's nothing else that it could be. Here's just a few more images showing you that very nicely. Another case, very similar, big mass, benign splenic cyst. There's some higher density, sometimes hemosiderin. Fibrosis can explain some wall thickening. But if you see a lesion like this, you're not going to leave it alone. It's too large, it's thick walled. I can think about an old hematoma, maybe an infarct, but also epithelial cysts. I'm thinking of a cystic lesion, probably benign. But, you know, you need to be thinking about it, but this is surely going to be resected. It's interesting on the more inferior aspects, there is some septations present. This lesion's coming out. This ended up being benign. Another example, here's a simple cyst, intrasplenic. Again, size-wise, symptom-wise, this is going to come out. This was a simple cyst. Again, water density, well-defined, compression of the normal splenic tissue, and again, simply pushing down. Another case. Again, in this case, you're not sure where it is. Is it spleen, or is it from the pancreas, or is it from the adrenal, or is it retroperitoneal? I think sometimes very large lesions, and I've spoken about that before, you can be fooled. Could it be off the stomach, off the pancreas, off the kidney, off the spleen? But you can see it here, well-defined, sharp wall, cystic. It's kind of coming off the spleen, though. I have to admit, it looks like almost the spleen is compressed rather than the lesion coming from the spleen. You could look at it with multiple windows and multiple reconstructions, but at the end of the day, I'm sure it's benign, but I'm also sure it's coming out. Here it is with cinematic rendering. Again, nicely defined, the cystic nature. There it is again, and this was resected, and it was a splenic epithelial inclusion cyst. Now, most of the time, those lesions are more centrally located, and you have spleen all around them. But again, I like to show this case because it makes the point about how exophytic splenic lesions can be, and when they are, how challenging it is. Now, in this article um, by consuls, some cysts may have internal septations that enhance with contrast administration. Up to 14% of true epithelial cysts can have thin curvilinear wall calcifications. 
but calcifications can also be seen within septations. When compared to pseudocysts, which are the primary differential diagnosis, true epithelial cysts are more likely to have internal enhancing septations, but are less likely to have wall calcification. Okay, so that's something to think about. Now, this brings up the thing about calcification. What causes calcifications in the spleen? Well, granulomas are the most common things, TB or histo, these little dot calcifications. I have a couple of great cases, I should have thrown one in here, of patients with pneumocystis in the AIDS era, where they got pneumocystis and diffuse splenic calcification. You also can see prior abscesses, you can see prior infarcts. It's rare for tumors to calcify, though theoretically some metastases, like from colon cancer or ovarian cancer, at times the mucinous tumors and indeed can calcify. Now, we also should mention there's rare things like hydatid cysts, but you would not see splenic lesions without liver lesions. They typically have daughter cysts, often with air fluid levels or fluid fluid levels or with calcification. So again, it's something to think about, but in the U.S. it's very rare. And every time I've seen cases in articles or textbooks, and whenever is a dangerous word, but typically you are going to see lesions also in the patient's liver. So here was a good case, left up a quadrant pain. And this one I'm looking at, and I thought, could it be hydatid cysts? Has multiple septations. There's some unusual enhancement. There's also like a fluid fluid level. You see septations in the lesion, best shown on the coronal view. You see the septations in the fluid fluid levels nicely on the 3D imaging. And now here's venous, multiple cystic lesions, a big spleen. I'm kind of having a hard time. It kind of bulges out. I th that always makes me think of hamartoma. But usually you don't think about cystic lesions and multiple cystic lesions and hamartoma. Here it is in cinematic rendering where it looks like a cluster of cystic lesions with thickened septations, which are enhancing. A very interesting case. There it is cut in half. I could be thinking hydatid cyst, but the patient's history wasn't really very good for that. This patient had surgery. This was the PATH report. A vascular mass with extramedullary hematopoiesis and areas of hemorrhage. They felt this was probably a hemangioma, which had previously bled. Very unusual. It was a benign lesion, but a very unusual appearance. Now, another case, incidental splenic lesion. The slight irregularity of the posterior wall. Here you might say, gee, is this a complex cystic lesion? Could it be a cystic metastasis? There's subtle perfusion changes in the spleen, but that posterior wall does bother me. It still could be a cyst, and there is some calcification. Old hematomas can have calcification, sometimes dense calcification, sometimes thin calcification, but they can have calcification. So it's something to think about. Because the patient was symptomatic, this was resected, and this was an old hematoma. So cystic lesions, particularly with calcification, hematoma is always a good thought. Sometimes the patient remembers history. Most of the time, they do not. So now let's look at splenic lesions, which are solid or appear solid and are well-defined. But before we do this, let's just take a five-minute break. Let's get some coffee, and let's come right back. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.